My name is John Lobel, and this is a sketch for a lecture for Kansas. This is sketch number three. So our lecture this evening is Between Silence and Light, How Shall We Live in the Modern World? A bit about my background, school, work, sculpture, etc. And this is my book, Visionary Creativity. You'll find an in-depth look at some of the ideas we'll talk about this evening in this book. This is another one of my books, Between Silence and Light, and it's about the spiritual philosophy of the architect Louis Kahn, and that's what we're going to focus on this evening. Now I'm going to begin with the Beaux-Arts. I'm going to be talking about modern architecture and Louis Kahn's response to it, but let's go back just a bit and Beaux-Arts architecture is those buildings with columns. So in New York, that would include the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And at the opening of the 20th century, the Beaux-Arts was in full flower. And who would have thought that by 1939, the Museum of Modern Art would be done in a totally different style, modern architecture. This is... Uh, important for us because Kahn was educated in this Beaux-Arts tradition. So the term Beaux-Arts comes from the École des Beaux-Arts school in Paris where a lot of the architects, American architects at the turn of the century studied. And in 1893 we get the World's Columbian Exposition or Chicago World's Fair and three quarters of a million people came on opening day, three million over the course of the fair. And then they said, why doesn't my city look like this? And they went home and built it. So here we are in New York, Grand Central Terminal, uh, in this Beaux-Arts style with this grand vaulted interior. And these architects were aware they were in the 20th century. There's 11 skyscrapers sitting on top of... Uh, on top of Grand Central Station, two subways and a railroad and, an, and a road run through it. And there's 11 stories going down. So it doesn't just sit on the ground. It's quite a modern megastructure. Here we are, 1937 to 41. We're still building this architecture. The National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. My parents were young intellectuals in Washington at the time and were outraged <laughs> that something this dated would be built because Frank Lloyd Wright had already was in his third phase doing falling water by this time. So how does the Beaux-Arts understand ourselves in the world? What is it telling us? And it's telling us that we are rooted in Rome. Rome which itself is rooted in Greece and coming to us through the Renaissance, but we are historically rooted creatures. So here's the Roman pantheon, and this is very much how John Russell Pope begins his National Gallery. So the Beaux-Arts implied that we are descendants of Rome, which had Greek influences by way of the Renaissance, our art descends from classical European tradition. Our literature de descends from these traditions. Our philosophy from these traditions. We are historical creatures built upon the past. And this art is depicting what it means to be a human being based on these traditions. Modern architecture We'll start, we'll just look at a couple of modern architects and try to see it, how it projects a totally different worldview. And here's Frank Lloyd Wright. We can tell the story of Frank Lloyd Wright in this one building, the Price Tower. And here is a building that was done by Louis Sullivan. And Frank Lloyd Wright worked on this building. And Sullivan gives us the three parts of the office tower, base, shaft, and cornice. 
And so it puts this architecture in the humanist tradition. But when you come around to the side of the building, right here, you don't see that part. So Sullivan doesn't bother to put this suit of clothes over it. Let's it sit there naked, just the plain brick. Wright objected to that. When he does his office tower, <clears throat> you can see how the aesthetic is not applied like a suit of clothes, but is coming from the inside out. And so the structure and the functions of the interior of the building, as well as the sunlight on the exterior of the building, are giving us the form of the building. So Wright begins his career with what's called the prairie style. These low slung horizontal buildings, symbolic of the emergence of a new way of life, the American suburbs, a, an era of technological development, movement, American movement westward across the prairie, he uses what we call the open plan. So instead of the human being in the center is the stair and fireplace core. And we move around it. We are sort of pressed away from the center in a Copernican revolution to move from inside to outside and around this otherwise occupied center. And how you move through the building determines the building. Our movement through it creates the architecture. Contrast that with the National Gallery, which puts the human being in the center. Now we are exiled to be a part of nature, integrated with nature. Now we'll just focus on right for a moment because this is what all of modern architecture goes through. So when Wright was growing up, the small farm was a place of production and consumption. By the early 20th century, production moved to the factory or office, and the home was a place purely for consumption. That's the beginning of the American suburban house. When Wright was growing up, the Milky Way was the entire universe. By the 1920s, we knew that ours was one of just billions of galaxies in an expanding universe. When Wright was growing up, we had Newton's sense of space and time. In 1905 and 1915, Einstein gave us special and general relativity, which put space and time in flux, just the way it is in Wright's architecture. When Wright was growing up, Painting was still organized by perspective, as we see even in this Impressionist Degas. But by the early 1900s, Picasso and others had developed cubism, destroying the fixed point of view, and we move around the subject, and it is shattered. And this jumps to a bit later, but uh, when Wright was growing up, we had a traditional family after dinner, the father goes to the smoking room, the mother goes to the sewing room, the children go to the nursery, and today it's a zoo, <laughs> as we see in the uh, hit TV series Modern Family. And Wright's open plan without boxes for fixed functions is symbolic of that different worldview. So another modern architecture, we'll come back to him, Walter Gropius, does the Bauhaus, and we're going to see how the building is laid out based on its functions and has again decentered us. So, how does modern architecture understand ourselves and the world? And it comes from a materialist scientific worldview, and we can sort of do a quick overview of modernism and go way back to the Renaissance. So in Leonardo da Vinci, we have an observation of nature. We now have, with perspective painting, our point of view, looking at, examining uh, and nature. Then with Isaac Newton, we have an understanding of nature. So Newton's able to take, for example, observations of the falling apple 
and render it into a theory of gravity. Then we come to, in the early 19th century, the control of nature. So James Watt, among others, gives us the steam engine in which we take these understandings and we harness them to benefit ourselves. And then with the Enlightenment, we get the application of these to human beings so that we can understand human individuals and human society and harness that understanding to make a better world, a better human environment. So we call that the Enlightenment and the Declaration of Independence and Constitution are two of the great Enlightenment documents. Taking these ideas a bit further, Darwin shows how we are natural creatures descended from earlier animals. Karl Marx shows us that we can have a scientific theory to understand and take control of history. And Sigmund Freud gives us an understanding of the mechanisms of the mind and we can intervene in and change the functioning of those mechanisms. Now, we might today disagree with, develop further, have opinions about these approaches, but in the early 20th century, this is what was presenting our view of nature. It was something we were a part of nature and we can understand and control it even our history and our minds. We see among the modernists ideologies based on the scientific worldview. We must invent and rebuild the future city like an immense tumultuous shipyard, Santilia, futurist. If we eliminate from our hearts and minds all dead concepts in regard to the house, we will, we will arrive at the machine house, the mass production house, healthy and morally so too, and beautiful. So this machine aesthetic, this mechanistic scientific understanding is going to make not only a more efficient home, but a morally superior one. Reason and science, man's greatest powers are the regents, the rulers, and the engineer is a sedate executor of unlimited potentials, mathematics, structure, and mechanization are the elements, and power and money are the dictators of this modern phenomena of steel, concrete, glass, and electricity. So a very mechanistic worldview underlies this modern architecture. And so the modern architect begins with a program. The program describes the institution, lists the activities, requirements, square footage, relates these activities with diagrams, and then you fill out these for the required square footage, frame them and clad the building, and you have a modern building. So this Bauhaus by Walter Gropius we saw has classrooms, workshops, which he sees in glass like a giant factory, studios where we have these individual units, administration that links all of these, and there's our building. So modern architecture implies that we no longer regard ourselves as classical Europe's cultural descendants. We partake of a universal humanity. Reason and scientific knowledge, not history, are the defining human qualities. And reason and science are the means of knowing the world, society, and ourselves. We are rootless, scientifically determined creatures. So let's look at Louis Kahn and see what might be an alternative to that. Kahn was born in Estonia, but he came to Philadelphia at the age of five, so he's an American. Studied at the University of Pennsylvania when it was a Beaux-Arts school. Graduated in 1924, and then his career sort of went into hiatus shortly after he graduated the Great Depression and then World War II. The few buildings he did during that time were socially based, trying to implement a progressive social vision. They were extremely undistinguished. But then beginning in 1960, he started doing some of the finest buildings of our time. 
And if you're interested in Khan's life, there's a wonderful movie by his son, Nathaniel Khan, My Architect. So we'll look at Khan's medical towers. This was completed around 1960. The University of Pennsylvania, I'm rather familiar with it, it was sort of built outside of my dorm when I was uh, a student there. And we see these three pavilions around a central core. So what's he doing here? And Kahn starts with the question, what is science? And he says there's two parts to science. There's measurement. And the, so this is the realm of stainless steel. He says this is where the lab tables are, test tubes, measurements are done. But then the scientist takes those measurements and goes to the light, which is going to be in the periphery here, to render those measurements into a scientific theory. We need a structure for this, and so he's going to use these precast members to encase this in a structure. Uh, we need to get in and out. We need air ducts. We need uh, means of egress, fire stairs. We don't want to put those in the center uh, because we want that open, flexible space. We don't want to put them in the corners because that's our view outward. And we've got three of these linking to our central core, which has shared services, elevators, toilets, stairs, etc., and there's our building. It's put together out of precast concrete like a giant, uh, like giant Lego blocks. And it's very interesting. It's post-tension. I won't really go into what that is. But the reinforcing bars are slid into the concrete and then tightened up with hydraulic jacks. And then this story of what it is and how it's put together, how these precast columns are set in place is told to us every time we enter the building, we look up, and there's the story of how it's built. Khan says, the man is the record of the making of the man. The building is the record of the making of the building. Jonas Salk, who had developed the Salk polio vaccine, a scientific superhero of his day, saw the building and said, I want you to build that building for me. Khan says, you don't get that building, you get your building. It's on the cliffs of the Pacific Ocean in La Jolla, California. Beautiful building, one of the great buildings of the 20th century. This fantastic plaza, which is like a cathedral without a ceiling. And without going into the Salk Center in detail. Kahn has this approach that he calls form and design. Form is the underlying conceptual organization of the building. Design is the particular manifestation of that archetype in the circumstantial world. Using, responding to the site, using what materials the building is going to be built in. So, the medical towers and Salk share the same underlying form, but they have different designs. So they both have this shared a mechanical space. They both have this laboratory space. Here the um, service spaces are pulled away from the laboratory space. And here, instead of the scientists going to the periphery, which was always kind of crowded in the medical towers, we have these separate studies for the scientists. This is Kahn's Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, with a series of vault-like forms and this beautiful uh, illuminated vault-like ceiling on the inside. Light comes through this open slit right here and is reflected and washes the vaults. And this is the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven, Connecticut. And we come in here through this dark space underneath and then explode up into the light. 
This is the Exeter Library in, at Exeter, uh, Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. And here we see what looks like a rather dull brick box, but then again it explodes up into the light in the interior. And here Khan says there should be a place with great tables on which a librarian can put the books, and the reader would take the books and go to the light. So here's this great space where these tables could be put, and then you take the book and go to the perimeter here to these little study carrels, and you have your own little window and sit here with your book at the light. And here's the kids covering these with uh, notes and pictures of uh, friends, etc. Now, here's this brick exterior. Here's this brick exterior of Exeter. And this is very important to Khan because this is not just a brick sheathing of the building, but rather it's an atonement for Khan. Here in the medical towers, these Here in the medical towers, these towers are poured in place concrete. They're then covered with brick as a sheathing, as a skin, a brick veneer. Here, the brick is a spandrel wall, brick and block. These are very different. This is a partition wall, this is a veneer, but Khan makes them look the same. And in addition, uh, brick doesn't want to be a veneer. Khan says, brick is a noble material. Brick's built Rome. You don't want to use it as like paint to put over the concrete. So here, these are actually the columns that support the building. And these are not concrete spandrels, but they are flat arches. These bricks are wedged in. So this brick is structural. Here we see the brick and block wall, uh, or rather column, here. And here's this brick spandrel arch. And so the brick is able to be its own structure. So how does Khan understand ourselves and the world? And he begins with the question of monumentality. Khan begins with the issue of monumentality. Now, how, how do we define monumentality? Here, this is obviously monumental, and it's based on one of the great monuments of all time, the Roman Pantheon. So monumentality is the celebration in the form of a past that we value and feel is still living in us. Bozart vocabulary was Roman, uh, and was saying that Rome, Roman values, live in us to this day, said that we are Greek, Roman, and European in our origins and our culture. Modernism rejects, rejects monumentality. The program of modernism is, is to make a new human being and a new society to reject the past and European culture. They're negative and should be done away with. And instead, we should build a new universalist, materialist culture rooted in science, not the past. Therefore, they rejected monumentality. Famous modern critic says, Lewis Mumford says, if it's a monument, it's not modern, and if it's modern, it cannot be a monument. Kahn abandons monumentality, as did the other modern architects, but he felt that that left us hollow, 
what are we built on if not the past? To say we're built on the here and now, on scientific materialism, he found that inadequate. So Kahn rejected imitating the past, but he did not accept modernist materialism. Instead, he pursued a third way, which he called order. It was not monumentality, a rootedness in the past that modern architecture was lacking, but order, a rootedness in its own nature. So Kahn introduces this term order, and he can't describe what it is. He says, I stop by not saying what it is and just saying order is. So order is, I'm going to say what it is, I'm not supposed to, but order is the underlying principle of all things. Now, how do we describe that? How do you describe something that you can't describe directly? And the answer is you use a poetic metaphor, silence and light. He says, inspiration is the feeling of beginning at a threshold where silence and light meet. So silence is the realm of potential. It's the unmeasurable. It's the realm of desire to be. If you're going to design a building, Kahn begins every building with the question, what does this building want to be? Right away, there's uh, two problems. One is, does it exist yet? And two is, how can a building want anything? It's an inanimate thing. Well, Kahn says, before we bring it into manifestation, it is in the realm of potential, the realm of silence. It is desiring to be in a certain way. What does this building want to be? And we, the architects, reach over a threshold, which is art, to bring the building into manifestation, into the realm of light. Now, there are parallels to this in other modern architects. So this is Louis Sullivan. And Sullivan says, the germ is the real thing. So this is a, a seed. Imagine a peanut. You split it open. This is the germ. This is the part that's going to grow. This part provides the food until photosynthesis can get going. But here is the real thing. The germ is the real thing, the seat of identity. Well, how do we describe that today? That's the DNA, right? Within its delicate mechanism lies the will to power, the function, which is to seek and eventually to find its full expression and form. In other words, the acorn wants to be an oak tree. And so Sullivan sees the same thing in architecture. The architect helps the office building achieve its desire to be a proud and soaring thing. Frank Lloyd Wright says something similar. What is honor? Not the rules of a code, but the nature of honor. What would be the honor of brick? That in the brick which makes the brick a brick. So the brick has in it a will, has in it what Wright calls honor, that brings to it hardness, redness, squareness, that makes the brick a brick. So we can imagine three worlds. The materialist world. So here is our solar system as envisioned during the Renaissance and Baroque eras, mechanistic, great mechanism. In China, we have the notion of the Tao, the way of all things. There's an energy represented by the dragon flowing through nature, and our architecture is open to the flow of that energy. In the West, we slay the dragon. We conquer nature. We subdue nature. In traditional China, we work with it and its natural flow, which is called the Tao. So the great work about Taoism is the Tao Te Ching. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. That's what Kant said about order. The, and then there is the nameless, Kant silence, is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of the 10,000 things. That's Kant's realm of light and then material. Ever desireless, we can see the mystery. 
have a desiring, one can see the manifestations. But these two spring from the same source, but differ only in name. Then the Tao Te Ching says, do you think you can control nature? Do you think you can take over the universe and improve it? I do not believe it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. If you try to change it, you will ruin it. And so these are, China's pretty, <laughs> you can't even breathe in China. It's such a polluted mess these days. But that's still their aspiration. These are contemporary temples in a park. And we see these attitudes toward nature even today. And then let's look at Buddhism. Buddhism holds that the universe is the field of the interlocked consciousness of all beings. Our individual consciousness is a partaking of an eternal component of that world. And the world has always been and will not end. So here's these three very different views that of materialism, of Taoism, and of Buddhism. Here's an idea called the Second Renaissance, put forward by Robert Thurman. And Thurman says, the West mastered, it's put forward by Robert Thurman. Robert Thurman is a prominent American Buddhist, uh, the first Tibetan, the first American Buddhist monk in the Tibetan tradition. He's now a professor at Columbia. He is good friends with the Dalai Lama founder of Tibet House, a Buddhist cultural institution in New York. And he talks about what he calls the Second Renaissance. He said, the West mastered the outer world of material, the East mastered the inner world of consciousness, and the Second Renaissance will bring the two together. So let's look at where physics, Western physics is actually going. Here's James Jeans, and he says, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. And here's John Archibald Wheeler, great American physicist. No phenomena is a real phenomena until it is an observed phenomena. In other words, our observation, he says, creates not only the here and now, but the distant and past. And in quantum theory, our observation actually creates the world as it exists. And we're beginning to see how these Buddhist ideas come together with these Western ideas. So here's Herbert Gunther in one of his last books. And he says, only now can we start to understand Buddhism because it parallels ideas in postmodernism, ideas of Heidegger and Deleuze. It parallels ideas in quantum theory. And these ideas have only come into focus in the past couple of decades. And only now can we fully start to understand um, these Buddhist ideas. So here is Pajma Paramita, goddess of transcendent wisdom. Eyes are closed in contemplation. Here is Michelangelo's David. Eyes are focused, intense thought going on. The intention here in Buddhism is to quiet the spontaneous chatter of the mind stuff. Here, we focus on the activity of our mind. What would happen if we start to bring these two together? So the Tao Te Ching says, the Tao begot one, one begot two, two begot three, and three begot the 10,000 things. But these two spring from the same source but differ in name. Louis Kahn says, I liken the emergence of light to the manifestation of two brothers, knowing quite well that there are not two brothers, nor even one. Well, we know what the one is and the two is. Not sure what, what is the three. And when Kahn says there are not two, meaning there is they're actually one and the same. But then he says, nor even one. Well, I haven't figured these out yet. I'm still working on that. So maybe you'll have some thoughts. So Khan's model of the world is one of silence and light. We reach through the threshold of art to the realm of potential and bring things into manifestation in the realm of light.
Kahn writes, a work is made in the urging sound of industry and when the dust settles, the pyramid echoing silence gives the sun its shadow. Thank you.